We all remember the horrific acts of terrorism on September the 11th of 2001 on American soil. After that, Homeland Security implemented an advisory system, HSAS. This was a color-coded terrorism threat advisory scale, also known as terror alert level. It was designed to keep the American public informed on the threat level at any given time. Green represented low risk of terrorist attacks. Red represented severe risk of terrorist attacks. It was replaced in 2011 with the National Terrorism Advisory System. If believers during Peter's day, if they had a system like this, it would have been set to red. It would have been set to red. Severe attacks. And it would have been set to red 24-7 because they were under extreme attack 24-7. I am afraid that the American brand of Christianity that we've come to know in these times has lulled a number of believers to sleep. They either have no idea that the church is at war or they have identified the wrong war. Both are very dangerous. From a spiritual perspective, the threat level against the church right now is severe. You need to know that. I need to know that. The threat level against us as believers in Jesus Christ, yes, in this country, is severe. Brothers and sisters, right now, we are under attack. We are under attack right now. First Peter 5, verse 8, Peter said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, <clears throat> whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So the opening instructions here in verse 8 are reflective of the reality of the hour at that time. The church was under extreme attack. To be a Christian in the Roman Empire at this time meant that you had a giant bull's eye on your life. You were a target. You were a target for sure. And because in this country we do not see Christians being burned alive or tortured in the streets publicly, we are misguided about the reality of being under attack. As a matter of fact, to hear something like that, we might say, well, I think you're exaggerating just a little bit. I don't think things are as bad as you are saying that they are. We sit in comfortable climate control rooms like this. We sit in nice coffee shops and drink $7 coffees and talk about scriptures and have our Bibles open and do discipleship and things like that. And, and without persecution. <laughs> what's, so, what's, what's so horrific in this country? What's, what's, what do you mean we're under attack? Here's what we must understand, and I knew we got to get this. Listen, the devil's attacks are multifaceted. The devil's attacks are multifaceted. It is. Some countries... He uses communism. He'll work through communism to attack the church. And listen, in some countries, he'll work through and use democracy. Absolutely. While we're sipping high-end coffee drinks and trying to outsmart one another in, in doctrinal debates, the groundwork right now is seriously being laid for the church to be in a very deep and real struggle, I am telling you, as clear as you can hear my voice right now, the day is coming and it is fast approaching where we as Midtown Baptist Temple will find ourselves in a deep struggle regarding what we can and cannot say from this book. We're not far from that day. 
The groundwork for that day is being laid as you hear my voice. You go, no way. 30 years ago, the idea of two men or two women being legally married in this country was foreign at best. 30 years ago, you said, what are you talking about? Legalizing gay marriage. What are you, (laughs) please. But in 2015, the United States Supreme Court legalized it in all 50 states. 30 years ago, if you were watching TV and you saw two men kiss, you saw two women kiss. Listen, even unbelievers would have been outraged. Even unbelievers would have been outraged. 30 years ago, there was outrage over public schools teaching evolution. That seems lightweight now, doesn't it? (laughs) Folks, it's not that it's coming. It's here. It's here. we've, We've reached a point in this country, we've come to a point of no return. Restrooms, that that used to be a simple thing, right? Men, women, boys, girls. Those days are gone. Gender, that used to be real clear, clear cut and simple, right? Men, women, boy, girls, right? Those days are gone. Uh, The the days of of those things being simple for everybody, even unbelievers, those days are gone. And please, what I want you to see today, and stay with me, stay with me. This is not a political statement. Stay with me. I will justify this in just a moment. Having Republicans in office will not change or stop this. Okay, so since we are under attack, number one, stay ready. Stay ready. Isolationism is a national policy of avoiding political or economic entanglements with other countries. In other words, as a nation, if we're isolationists, we're only concerned about our nation. We have no interest in mingling and and yoking ourselves with other nations politically or economically. The day before Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, there were a number of Americans, many, who were fancying the idea of isolationism. They had no idea (laughs) that while they were daydreaming about that, that Japan (laughs) had done reconnaissance and they were planning an all-out assault on American soil. And they did it. So much for isolationism. Because the next day, America declared war on Japan and found itself thrust right into the war that was raging in Europe. Listen, brothers and sisters, staying ready starts with being biblical. Amen. Starts with being biblical. He says, be sober. We're very familiar with this command. And I think what we hear is read your Bible. Read your Bible. It's not just that you read your Bible. It's that reading reading the Bible alone doesn't make you sober. You can read the word of God every morning. That doesn't mean you're sober. Here's what it means to be biblical, because if you're sober, it means you're biblical. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. The word prove means to test. So when you're truly sober, you'll be biblical, which means you test everything according to this. You run everything through this. And when you run everything through this, you're not misguided about what's really going on in the country. You're not deceived about where things really are and where they're really going, and not just that, but why they're going that way. You're not deceived like, the, uh, like those who were fancying the idea of isolationism. You know better. 
You know what's really happening. Uh, When you are biblical, listen, it means that you have a biblical worldview. That is, you look at everything through the lens of Scripture, and that shapes your perspective of everything happening in the world. That sounds, I guess, normal, right? I mean, don't all believers have a biblical worldview? Would you listen to this? According to research done by the Cultural Research Center in 2020, only half of America's pastors, 51%, have a biblical worldview. Only half of American pastors, according to research, actually perceive and look at things through the lens of Scripture. Only half of American pastors are biblicists. Now, if that's true of pastors, half of American pastors, what does that say about the flock? What does it say about the people? What does it say about believers? It says that many have no idea what's really going on and why it's going on and where it's heading. Next, be watchful. He says, be vigilant. That's what it means to be vigilant. You have to be watchful. You do. You can't be oblivious. You can't be asleep. You can't be in the dark. You have to know. We are under attack. Listen, the believers in the Roman Empire at this time, they weren't deceived. They understood they were under attack. They weren't in the dark on that. Matthew 26, 40 and 41, And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can I tell you one of the reasons that so many times we melt in the face of temptation is because we're not watching and praying. We're not spiritually prepared. We're not being biblical. We're not being watchful. We're just going through life. We're not being circumspect. We Forget just how weak we are. If you had an idea of how weak you really were in the flesh, if you really believe the word of God about how weak you really are, because we all are, you would not take the spiritual vacations that you take. You would not take the days off that you take. The days that you take off where you just don't want to pray and you want nothing to do with God, you want to do your own thing. If you had any idea the risk you were taking, the gamble you were taking, you were rolling the dice. You get a clear example of this in the book of 2 Samuel, which is a book that we're actually going to spend some time in once we're done with 1 Peter. One of the things that David did was he took a day off, didn't he? And boy, how did that work out? Not well. You are so weak. I am so weak. We cannot afford to not watch and pray, brothers and sisters. Jesus had come to his most critical hour. This was not a time for sleeping. This was not a time for sleeping. Peter would have remembered this. This is why he said in chapter 4, verse 7, Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. He remembered how critical it was to watch and pray. Because this was a massive point of failure. And understand, what we saw in Matthew 26 regarding Jesus essentially reproving them for not watching and praying and falling asleep, as it pertains to Peter, That preceded his massive failure. If Peter had any idea what awaited him around the corner, the temptation that was waiting for him to deny his Lord three times, just as he did, he would have been on his face praying without ceasing. If he had any idea. But you know what? In his foolish estimation... And we do the same thing. I believe with all my heart that Peter's greatest failure 
was not him actually denying the Lord three times. As awful as that was, there was something that was far worse than that. You know what that was? And it's something that I think we all can be vulnerable to. He did not believe he was capable of doing it. He did not realize how weak he was. Remember what he said? Though all men be a fit, not me. (laughs) I would never. Oh, man. The flesh is weak. Have you not done the math on you? I hope you have. Listen. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be honest with you. I am capable of the absolute worst. I'm capable of it. In my flesh dwells no good thing. I am capable of adultery. I'm capable of murder. I'm, I'm capable of lying. I'm capable of stealing. I have the carnal propensity within my flesh to do all those things and so much more. You go, okay, this is my last Sunday in life fellowship. (laughs) Yeah, I hear you. But let me just break it to you. The same is true for Mitch. The same is true for Sam. I'm sorry. The same is true for you. Maybe you haven't done the math on you yet. But oh yeah, you got it. You got it within you. I'm sorry. Please. The flesh is as weak as the hour is critical. The flesh is as weak as the hour is critical. If we are biblical, we will be watchful. We will be aware of what's really happening in the world. Listen. If you're biblical, You're going to know what's really going on more than Fox News does, more than CNN does. If you're biblical, if you're biblical, you'll watch the news differently. If you're biblical, you'll watch the news and sometimes you'll laugh and go, they have no idea. Why? Because they don't have a worldview, a biblical worldview, that is. You go, no, 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 that's. You have no idea what's happening. You have no idea that peace in the Middle East is a pipe dream until the millennial reign of Christ. You have no idea. (laughs) So you guys can waste all the energy you want and fly wherever you want over there and have all the summits and conferences and whatnot. And when the dust clears, they'll still be throwing bombs and killing each other until the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is reigning on the throne in Jerusalem. That's the truth. Biblical, watchful, and when we are, it moves us to pray. Listen, uh, please hear my heart here. There is no guilt. I mean this when I say this. There's no guilt. But this is ultimately why we do what we do every Friday morning at 630 on Zoom. You're all invited. Uh, Keith puts the link out. If you have any questions about life prayer, please talk to Keith. Raise your hand if you don't know who Keith is. Keith McHudson. Uh, he, he leads that for us in Life Fellowship. <clears throat> Why do we do that? Because the hour is critical. <laughs> we, gotta, we must pray. We're desperate. <laughs> right? We take God's word and we just simply pray it back to Him. Why? Because we, we, we're, we're looking through the lens of this. So that even forms how we pray. You're welcome to join. If you're not, I don't think less of you. Just want to make sure you know that you can join us. Verse 80 goes on to say, Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Number two, know your enemy. Know your enemy. May I ask, do we wrestle against flesh and blood? We don't. Do you know what a, what, what a dead giveaway is? That you're not sober and that you're not vigilant. You know what a dead giveaway of that is? You find yourself constantly wrestling with people. You've identified the wrong enemy. 
You look at your spouse and you have an adversarial perspective of them, don't you? You look at your wife, look at your husband, and you see them as your enemy. You look at brothers and sisters in Christ and you identify them as your enemy. No, 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 you're not wrestling against them. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. No, Ephesians chapter 6 tells us very clearly, and so does Peter here. Would you notice who Peter identified as the adversary? Not the Roman government who was butchering Christians. Surely they're the adversary, right? No. Who's the adversary? The devil. (laughs) The devil. Listen, our enemy is not the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. That's not who I'm wrestling with. If you want to really, listen, I have no faith in either one of those. I don't. Because they are flawed, fallen people who, when the dust clears, do not look at things through the lens of this. So at some point, as much as I may disagree with them, at some point, not if, but at some point, there's going to be a win when they deviate from this boldly. Every party, every candidate will do that. Many believers, though, have been deceived into believing that their enemy is one of those parties. And they're going to wrestle against that or wrestle with that party. Listen, this is why Peter did not instruct believers to protest and fight with the government. Did you notice that? He does not do that. Listen, you can protest all you want, and you can exert great time and energy into politics, but listen, a biblical worldview says this, God is allowing the devil to prepare America and the world for the Antichrist. That's what's happening. God is allowing the devil to prepare the world and America to receive the Antichrist, regardless of how you vote or what political party you are affiliated with, this is where the train is heading rapidly. That's why I said, it doesn't matter who's in office. This is where the train is going. And no political party is going to slow it down or stop it. The groundwork is being laid as we speak. The masses are being massaged worldwide to receive the Antichrist. That's where it's going. So what do we do? For us, the answer is found in a number of places, but... To simplify it, look at Luke 6, 15 in your notes. This is giving us the list of the 12 that Jesus chose to be disciples and apostles. In verse 15, I want to look at two names, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealots. Matthew, Levi, was a publican a tax collector for the Roman government. In the eyes of Jews, it was the lowest occupation that a person could hold. They were also a traitor to their nation. They absolutely despised them. Simon was a zealot. This was a Jewish political party that had an appetite for rebellion against the Roman government. And that's how they ruled. They wanted to overthrow the Roman government. They despise being under the yoke of Rome. Simon the Zealot would have looked at Levi, Matthew, and said, you are a good-for-nothing, low-down traitor. That's who you are. You're a Benedict Earl. How could you work for the Roman government and assist them in their bondage of us? So here's Jesus who calls Matthew the publican and Simon the zealot. 
and you're going to be disciples. Listen, he was not calling Matthew, the publican, and Simon, the zealot, to argue and fight over their political differences. Boys, it's not about politics. I am calling you to follow me, and I'm going to make both of you fishers of men. That's the focus. Are you seeing this? That's what I'm saying. I, 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 listen, I, I don't care what your political appetite is or what, you, what podcast, I could care less. At the end of the day, we are not making Democrats and we are not making Republicans by the grace of God, for the glory of God, we only are focusing on making disciples indeed of Jesus Christ. Amen. Vote however you want. I don't need to hear about it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's the answer. Listen, one of the ways the devil attacks the church is through the distraction of politics. Boy, listen, I got to tip my hat to the devil. He's done a fine job these last couple of years. And now he's got believers at one another's throats over politics. Can I tell you, the worst part of the COVID-19 pandemic, from my perspective, was not the virus itself. It was the ridiculous politics around it. Period. The church is so divided. And listen, a number of churches, <laughs> it's nause this is nauseating to me, but a number of churches have actually converted their pulpits into political platforms. Where as you sit, you listen, there is no question about what side they're leaning. I've seen both. Where it's obvious, well, bro, you might as well just invite a political candidate to come speak for you that Sunday and let them espouse their stuff. Without realizing it, those who are there are being devoured by the devil. If you are not biblical and watchful, listen, the devil will devour you without you even realizing it's happening. That's why I said his attack is multifaceted. The devil is good. Okay? For some, it's politics. For some, it's, it's, it's money. For some, it's power. You name whatever it is. The devil's got something for you. He's got an attack plan for you. Now, the key uh, to verse 9 is found in verse 8. Verse 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Notice, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Wherever the church is, it is under attack. No church, no believer is exempt. So even if you are in a country of affluence like this country, and everything seems to be going okay. Everything seems to be comfortable. Everything, there's no outward persecution and all of that. No. If you are in the body of Christ, you are under attack. But the believer has overcome the devil in Christ. So listen, the devil can be resisted. Sadly, I believe that we give Satan way too much credit. And we give him too much power. You cannot resist him steadfastly in the faith, listen, if you're not biblical and watchful. That's the issue. Listen, he roars, yes, and he attacks. But listen, the success of the devil's attacks against you personally because he does attack you and he does come after you personally. Listen, the success of his attacks rests solely on the extent to which you are sober and vigilant. 
People often talk about Judas Iscariot and how the devil put it in his heart to, to betray Jesus. But, but, but people will look at Judas as if he's a victim. Oh, poor Judas. That's so terrible what the devil did to him. Listen, the devil did not do anything to Judas Iscariot that Judas Iscariot did not put the welcome mat out to. Amen. That was ultimately Judas's decision. The devil cannot have power over your life. The devil cannot defeat you. The devil cannot overwhelm you with discouragement and depression and all of these things that we blame him for. Except you and I decide to say, you know what? I'm not going to be sober. I'm not going to be vigilant. I'm not going to watch and pray. The moment that we make that decision, we have chosen to lose. It's over. But the moment you say, you know what, man, I'm going to be sober. I'm going to be vigilant. It's what Peter said. You win. Verse 10 and 11. My time is racing. I got a little bit more to go. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that, ye have suffered a while, make you perfect establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When you are under attack, listen, you must know your God. Not know God. You must know your God. And what you need to know first is who he is. This is so critical when you're under fire. Know who he is. There are at least four things. There are many more. But there are at least four things that God wants you to know about him, especially when you're in the valley, especially when the devil is roaring and raging and God is letting it happen. God does that, right? God will let the devil roar and he will let him rage in your life and in mine. And when that happens, not if, there are at least four things that God wants you to know about him. Number one, he is the God of hope. Romans 15, 13, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost, our hope is the eternal glory that we've been called to. So when the devil was kicking sand in your face and trying to smother you with defeat, you remember your hope. You remember your God who is the God of hope to say, Lord, you know what? When the dust clears, because I have a biblical worldview, I know how it all ends. I know how this ends. As a matter of fact, I'm already victorious because where am I sitting? Where have I been made to sit? I've been made to sit together in heavenly places. I'm already there. He is the God of all comfort. Second Corinthians 1 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. You know, you know who your God is. Your God is the God who meets you in the valley of despair and devastation and loss and pain. And he meets you. You know what he says? I'm here. And I've got comfort with me. What is it that indwells you? The spirit. What's he called? The what? The comforter. The Bible says that we even find comfort through the scriptures. God's the God of all comfort. I don't care what you're going through or what you are going to face. God's got enough comfort for it. He's a God of peace. Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. He's a God of peace. 
How about this? He's a God of all grace, as we see here in 1 Peter 5.10. But the God of all grace, no matter what, you got to remember those things. You know what? You, you, can, you can counsel yourself. You can counsel yourself. When you're in the valley, when you're hurting, you can say, you know what, God, I, I know there are four things about you that are true. Praise the Lord. But it's not just knowing who he is, but it's also knowing what he is doing. See, understand something. When you're under attack, the devil is not the only one who's doing something. He's not. God is also at work, and he's doing at least four specific things in your life when you're under attack. When you're in distress, when you're in a trial, when you're suffering, when you're hurting, and all these things, God is doing at least four things. Number one, He is completing us. He is completing us. Make you perfect, it says here. It means to complete thoroughly. Yes, positionally. Colossians 2.10, we are complete in Christ. That is true. No discrepancy there. But as it relates to our walk practically, you know what God is doing? God is using this suffering. God is using this attack. God is using this hardship to perfect us spiritually, to complete us spiritually. That's what he's doing. God is saying, I'm, I'm going to grow you through this. Next, he is directing us. It says establish. Most modern Bibles replace establish with establish because, of course, establish is wrong, right? Typically, the King James uses establish to refer to or reference someone being fixed in a doctrinal truth. Okay? Like being fixed with Israel, with God's covenant with them. Being, uh, being established in that. But established, as we see here, is used to refer to us practically walking or living out the doctrinal truths that we are established in. So it's not a mistake. When God is establishing us, He is order. I'm sorry, when God is establishing us, He is ordering our steps in His Word. God is saying, I am directing you. I am showing you how to walk. I am establishing you in, in, the, in the truths that you know. Where you are actualizing those things. You are living them out. He's teaching us how to walk. Next, he is empowering us to strengthen muscles which produce power. You have to break those muscles down first, right? The experience of that is not pleasant, but the dividends are. We appreciate that, don't we? Trials and difficulties are like that. We get stronger as God allows us to be broken down. But through that, God says, I am going to strengthen you. I'm going to empower you as a believer. Next, God is grounding us. We saw in Colossians 2, 6 that we are to be rooted and built up in Christ and established in the faith. And what is the outcome of that? According to Colossians 2, verse 6, the outcome of that is that we will be abounding in thanksgiving. Again, you see an example of how established is used there. When you are established in the faith, it results in you abounding in thanksgiving. That's your practical walk, which God desires. But God uses trials to ground us and take us deeper in the Word. Listen, there are things that you learn about God, and there are things that you learn about this book when you're going through a trial that you won't learn in a setting like this. There are things that you will discover. There are words that all of a sudden you've read a million times. But when you're in the valley, there's a word that just jumps out at you and you're like, man, I feel like this is the first time I've seen this. God's taking you deeper. And everything that has been said up until this point drives to verse 11. 
To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Adding amen to the end of a statement was a tradition or a custom that had been passed from Jewish synagogues to the early churches, and essentially what it represented was complete agreement. Complete agreement. I am, yes, I could not agree more. Ultimately, in a trial, we must add our amen to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. In other words, God, I'm in complete agreement with you that when it does clears, what this entire situation was and is about is your glory and dominion. Amen. I'm in complete agreement with you, God. It was never about how hard it was for me or how uncomfortable I was or how much pain I was in. No, no, no. It was never about that. It was always about your glory, God, and your dominion. And to that, we should all say amen. Amen. All right, verse 12, my time is running. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. Sylvanus is the Roman form of the Greek name Silas. But he would have delivered this epistle to the churches that Peter, or to the churches in the areas that Peter listed in the opening verse of this epistle, 1 Peter 1, verse 1. And from traveling with the Apostle Paul, Silas would not have been a stranger to those churches. They would have known him. All right, verse 13. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Sadly, the only word that seems to be of interest for too many people is the word elected. Sadly. In the very short time that I have left, and it is short, I want to make sure you understand, I will speak now on behalf of Midtown Baptist Temple from a doctrinal perspective as it relates to what we see here in 1 Peter 5, verse 13, the word elected. Our official position on this is stated in verse 2 of chapter 1 in this, cha- in this epistle where Peter said this, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In other words, election is always based on what God knows in advance. That's what Peter said in chapter 1 and verse 2. That's not what I said or Midtown Baptist Temple. You should also know that the first time the words elect, chose, or chosen appear in Scripture, they have nothing to do with anyone being chosen for salvation. Absolutely nothing. So at MBT, listen, we are not trying to figure out our position on this. Okay? We're not trying to figure it out. And we have no interest in debating and wasting precious time arguing about it. Not going to do it. It's a waste. Anyone can hold that position. If you believe that people are chosen to heaven and you believe some are chosen to hell, go for it. Understand at Midtown Baptist Temple, no pastor, no discipler, no leader, no teacher will teach that here. And it's not open for discussion. Listen, if some people are chosen to heaven and some are chosen to hell, I have no idea who they are. (laughs) So I'm not going to waste my time trying to figure that out. (laughs) What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the word of God and I'm going to try to live the Great Commission and just preach the gospel and make disciples and take the and see missions explode all over the world. And if I'm wasting my time on some, 
because they weren't chosen, I'll leave that to the Lord. I just want to be obedient. Okay, verse 13, there is discussion regarding the reference to Babylon. Is that, was that a literal or metaphorical reference? Listen, there are strong arguments for both. So I, 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 will, I will tell you, um, I don't know. And that, that can be a, a scary phrase for pastors, but I don't know. I really don't know. I, I will tell you this. Um, I, I, if you ask what I think, not that you should care what I think, right? But I, here's some things to think about. Historical Babylon was the center of paganism. We know that. Prophetically, uh, Babylon and Revelation 17 and 18, we understand that that will be rooted in paganism and false doctrine. Rome was the capital of paganism at this time. Peter spent the last days or years of his life in Rome. Marcus, John Mark, Peter's disciple, uh, was in Rome. We see that in Colossians 4, verse 10. So I, if you ask me, I, I, yeah, I, I think the, the reference to Babylon there, I, I think it was probably a reference to Rome. That's, Peter was writing to believers in the Roman Empire. And, um, but... I could also make an argument for it actually referring to a literal Babylon as well. Again, I don't know. If you do, let me know. In the end, I'm not sure how much it really matters. Obviously, it matters it's in Scripture, but in terms of me being definitive one way or the other, I don't know how much that matters. And then finally, verse 14, greet ye one another with a kiss of charity, Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. And Peter once again puts an amen, which is his way of putting an amen on everything he has said in this epistle leading up to this point, which I can't think of a better way to close out First Peter than us to the glory of God giving our amen. 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 Lord, thank you for the things that you have revealed to us as we've walked through this book, many things. God, I do pray that uh, you would bring these things to our remembrance as needed. Some are in the valley right now. Some are coming out of it. Some are on their way in. Lord, the things that we saw today are very critical for us to remember who you are and what you're doing. That's how we'll win in the valley. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.